There's no true, deep, deep relationship, but you have a love for them. For the individual you may pass on the street who may have the sign that says homeless, and 
the compassion that it pulls forth from you. That's phileo love, love that we have for one another. Then there's the next level of love, which we are seeing most often in the world in which we live, and it's the, the love called eros, or erotic love. And that's what you see on television. It's steeped inside of the physicalness. It's steeped inside of the emotionalness, emotionalism that's in, that is tied to encounters with individuals in this day and age of the same sex, of the opposite sex. And for the most part, it has to do with sex. So it's erotic love. Then there's another level of love, which is the, the love that is um, the love that you can observe when you're watching the um, parents or the grandparents or the mother who loves her child in spite of her child. No matter what that child has done, that child can do no wrong in the mother's eyesight. This love is almost kind of like the love. What is that gift? That is Jesus the Christ. For those of us who identify with Christianity as a spiritual system, religiously we know the story, the story of the gift that was given to Mary. Now, that may not have been such a great gift for Mary when she originally received it, when she had that encounter with the angelic being, and the angelic being told her that she was with child. She spoke that word into her, and she said, how can it be? Now, many of you are a gift. You have a gift, and you may say, how could it be? based on the family of origin that I have um, was birthed into, based, based on the experiences that I have had in life, you may say, how could it be that I am the gift or I am the carrier of a gift? Well, you know the story. Mary, um, she looked at that situation and she said, well, if it is to be, it will be, but I haven't been with a man. So it's talking about the spiritual gift here. So the seed was sown into the mind of Mary, and in due season, Mary manifested the boy child, which we call Jesus the Christ. Now, our whole spiritual system, our whole religious system, is built on the life of this Christ child over into adulthood. And for many of us, we get caught in the story instead of get caught in the messages. For it is the messages that Christ brought to us, and here was the primary message. It was a message of grace. So when we talk about a gift, it's talking about a grace, something that is being given. What is grace? Grace is simply this, God's redemptive act concerning everyone, G-R-A-C-E. So that's how I remember what grace is, God's redemptive act concerning everyone. So Jesus was sent into the earth that he may be the redeemer of all mankind, he was the gift that made room for all of us to return to God, to re realign ourselves, reposition ourselves with God as our creators. Now, this morning I want to look at Matthew chapter 27, verse 32 states, Jesus replied, there was a conversation that was ensuing about what is the greatest law. And Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first commandment. So that's the first commandment. He didn't say it was the greatest commandment, but he said it was the first commandment. And then he says there's another commandment that's tied to it, and it went like this. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, he says all the law, all the principles of the prophets hinge on these two things. One, that you love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your being. And two, that you love your neighbors as yourself. So the first one is a spiritual principle that we um, uh, are moving towards. We grow into that. We learn to love God with all of our heart. And then the second one is has more to do with the natural process of maturing. Now, what is love? True love is not conditional. If you say you love me and you are doing something for me with conditions to it, it's not true love. Most of what we get from those we, we encounter is not truly true love. It's a form of conditioned love inside of Christianity. The whole, when you look at religious systems themselves, if they're conditioned upon people believing, living like we do. And if they don't believe like we believe, if they don't do what we do, then we look to 
each, exterminate them. For some reason, each religious system, be it Christianity, Catholicism, be it um, Buddhism, not necessarily Buddhism, but when you look at um, um, the, the, the religions, that, the, the major religions, um, Islam, um, most of the problems we have in, our earth, in the earth realm today is because of religious people that espouse religious practices but don't live them out. And as a result, we have jihads or holy wars. Uh, in the name of God, we are killing people. In the name of God, we see where entire villages have been. Read the, read the New Old Testament. You re read stories of how God supposedly went in and wiped out women, children, cattle. Now, I have a problem with that because what it has done is presented to us an angry God, a mean God. A God who is looking to reciprocate, that is, if you don't do what it wants you to do, then it's going to get rid of you. Now, but if you go to the beginning of the book, he says man was created in God's image, after God's likeness, and man was given free will. So if you give someone free will, that means you have the okay to do what you want to do. And if you don't do what I would like you to do, I don't punish you. So we got to begin to relook this whole story about the love of God. God's love, sources love, divine intelligence's love is a perfect love. It's an all-encompassing love that meets people where they are. And through the experience of life, people expand, maybe leaving what they once knew as the way and walking into a more perfect way. Now, I want to challenge you this morning inside of this. The scripture says, love your neighbor as yourself. It's all about application. If you want to be a spiritual scientist, you have to learn to apply the things that you hear. Many of us have understanding, but very few of us have overstanding. The overstanding comes from applying what you understand, and when you apply it, when you have an experience that gives you the opportunity to put it to practice, and you play the thing out, now you have an overstanding, and when you have enough overstanding, guess where it goes? It becomes an understanding. Like I have an understanding when it comes to sickness and disease. When it comes to this whole pandemic thing, being a spiritual scientist, 40 years of living and practicing a belief system that says nothing can harm me, standing inside, inside, inside of the scriptures, I played it out. First it was the understanding. Then it went to application, and I had an overstanding. Now it is a place in my life where it's an understanding. So what I try to do for me, in order that I can maintain my sanity and maintain my peace, maintain my wellness, I stay out of those conversations. Because the more you get called in those conversations, the word says, as a man thinketh, so is he. So whatever seeds are being sown into your mind are the seeds that manifest in your life. We're going to continue to see what they're forecasting because they're forecasting. Man needs to know this. Your word is your wand. What you speak is what comes forth in your life and in the lives of the group who have that same group thing. So back to the scripture where it says, love your neighbor as yourself. See, when we talk about loving your neighbor, it's saying this. It's impossible to love God, source, divine intelligence, an invisible being who you cannot see, if you cannot love those who you can see. So he tells us to love our neighbor. Now it'll be interesting that he says, love your neighbor as yourself. So let's back into that. Most of us don't love ourselves. We are broken and incomplete. But I stopped by to tell you this morning that you are perfect, whole, whole. And complete. Come on, you're on the way to expressing what you were designed to be. But because of life experiences, the challenges we have, the whole conversation is today is I'm broken. You're not broken. You're broken if you take on the broke mentality. But Christ came to put us back together again. That once you understand that there's a power greater than you that surrounds you, that is concerned about you, that indwells in you, and that you can use this power, you can't say that you're 
imperfect. You can't say that you're incomplete. The Word says, I can do all things through the Christ consciousness that strengthens me. Now, one of the things we are called to do is to learn to love ourselves. And how you love others is an expression of how much you love yourself. And so, the ability or the opportunity to show love, because love is an action word. You know, you can't say love without practicing. Love usually has something associated with it. Like this season that we're in. We're in the season of giving. So I have a perfect gift. The Word of God says, what does it say about the gift? Now, this is important. The Word of God has something to say about the gift. And this gift that we are is important. He says, in this is Proverbs 22 and 29, or Proverbs 22 says, a gift opens the way. If you're going to see a king, or if you're going to see a dignitary, if you, now one of the things I learned early in life when I was in sales, and I had to get to the decision maker, you usually had to stop at the desk, the main desk, where there is a receptionist there. And so when I found that if you came bearing a gift to the receptionist, the reception, the receptionist made sure you had a reception with the person that you desire to. So we have to understand that we bring a gift to get in the door. Now, here's the gift you need to bring. The word says in, in Proverbs 29 that you see a man diligent and skillful in his work. He will not or she will not have an audience with men of mere means or paupers but will stand before kings. So, example, your gift made room for you here in this ministry, the gift that you use to play that piano. Pete has a gift that makes room for him. The individuals that are on the soundboard, the individuals who are part of this service, their particular gifting. See, sometimes we are filling a role in life that is not in alignment with our gift. But all of us need to find out what is my gift? Because once you identify your gift, and then you develop your gift. Cheryl is an excellent singer. She has mastered. She is not a hobby. It's not something she plays with. She sings all the time. When she's not singing in front of the camera, I guarantee you that she's at home uh, practicing, doing some warm-ups. Um, she's in the mirror making sure she's perfecting her delivery. These are part of what we do when we understand what our gift is. Because our gift makes room for us. If you're not able to get into certain places, you got to ask yourself, first of all, what problem do I solve? Your gift solves a problem. You are the gift that solves someone's problem today. What you got to understand, that until you can operate your gift in love, your gift is worthless. If you're operating your gift only to those who deserve it, those who um, desire it, then you're not allowing your gift to express fully as the gift that you are. If you have a gift, it's like having a light. When you have a light, you let your light shine. And your light shines on the good as well as the bad. The scripture says that, for it rains on the good as well as the bad. Your gift should be expressed to those who you consider good as well as those you consider bad. So as we move into this season, for many, they're starting the Hanukkah, the religious um, celebration of the Jewish holiday, and then we're over down later into this year, this, this month, we're celebrating Christmas uh, with Christmas trees, um, candy canes, peppermint candy, gifts, pancetas, all those things that makes for the cultural holiday. And then we, for those of us who are of the African descent, those of us who are in the diaspora, we celebrate Kwanzaa. And for me, I don't, I start my whole month with Kwanzaa. Getting my Kwanzaa table together. One of the aspects of Kwanzaa is the giving of gifts. Zawadi. Gifts that we give to our children. Gifts that pass on the culture. Pass on the, the beliefs that they need to hold on to. So, as we move into this part of the year, as you begin to go out to find the perfect gift, I want to tell you, the gift that is perfect is not to be purchased. You won't find it online. You won't find it in the catalog. You will find the gift that is perfect 
in you. You must come to the realization of who you are, whose you are. You want to know what your divine purpose is. You must know what your why is. And once you know what your why is, what your purpose is, then you can passionately move through life showing up as the gift that makes room for you in the lives of people, in the lives of situations and circumstances that call on you. So this morning, as you prepare to move into this next phase of your life, the end of the year, one of the things I encourage you to do is to recapitulate. Because you may find to recapitulate. You say, what is recapitulate? Go back over the year. And as you go back over the year, you may find what your gift is. You may find what your special gifting is. You may find that you showed up in a more powerful way than you ever showed up in life before. And now you've identified, and now you must perfect it. Now, the perfecting of your gift comes by way of experiences. And as you are perfecting your gift, you're going to have what I call failing moments. These are moments when things don't go the way you think they should. But know this, every setback, is a setup for you to come up. So when you have these failing moments, what it's helping you to do is to perfect the gift. And I'll close with this. When I was a kid, I, I was an asthmatic, or I was diagnosed as having asthma, and the doctor put me on a course of treatment. Then I had a conversation with God, and this conversation with God had to do with you created me perfect, whole, and complete. Then why am I showing up in life and I can't run, I can't play in the grass like the other little boys. I can't do this, that, and the other. And I had this real conversation at 12 with God. And God spoke to me. He says that if you study my word, he says study the word. And if you study the word, you will find the truth to be found in that thing. That God did not create you to be imperfect. God has created you to be perfect, whole, and complete. Even if you're showing up in an incomplete way, it's the process that can play itself out that you will know the power of God. So back to my story. So at 12, I could not do certain things. And I began to challenge the situation that I was succumbing to with the Word. So when I would get sick, I would say that I'm only going to be sick for three days. And that began to work. And then I said, I'm going to be sick for two days. And then I got to the point when I know I was sick, I would say, by the end of this day, the sickness will be over. And guess what? It worked. So I began to understand that there is a power greater than me that resides in me that gives me the ability to walk in the total and divine health. Now, if you're operating in life as a human being, then you don't have access to being a divine spiritual being. As a divine spiritual being, there's something greater than your humanness that allows you to express through your humanness in a superhuman way. And so because this is not being taught, by the church because we think it's the human condition for which it is, but we are not humans. We are divine spiritual beings created in the image and the life. Do you ever see Jesus being sick? Do you, have you ever read in the scripture where God was sick? Now, sickness and disease is two ends, of the opposite end of the spectrum of wholeness and health. Now, they both exist, but you choose this day which one you want to experience. If you make room for sickness and disease, guess what shows up in your life? There is a more perfect way. So my gift is making room for me this morning, and the gift is I'm a purveyor of possibility. There's a possibility that although you have been sick like the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years, 12 is that perfect and complete number. But she came to the realization that she was sick and tired of dealing with that issue. Maybe you're dealing with something today. Maybe you have a diagnosis or a prognosis. I want to say to you, there is a more perfect way. There is another possibility. But if you subscribe to what the world says, what the, human, what the medical sciences or the medical doctor says, and you limit it to that, then you don't get the full opportunity to see God in expression. Be it according to your belief. So I pray this morning that my gift has made room for me amongst you. That you will take some time this week and explore what is your gift. You'll take some time this week and look at another possibility. A possibility that's very different than what you've been experiencing. And so it is.
Why don't you bow your heads? Right where you are. I want you to take a deep breath. Breathing in deeply through your nostrils. Expanding your lungs to full capacity. Holding that breath for the count of three. One, two, three. Now exhale, relaxing and releasing all the way down to the bottom of the breath. When you come to the bottom of the breath, now I want you to place a soft smile on your face and hold it through the duration of this breathing meditation. Now I'm taking another deep breath together, breathing in through your nostrils, expanding your lungs, taking a full breath, the breath of life, touching every cell, every system, every organ, bringing them all in alignment with perfect wholeness and completion. Now, exhale, releasing that which once served you, that no longer serves you, all the way down, and continue to breathe in and out as I take you through this morning's meditation, accompanied by our pianist. When insecurities tempt you to doubt your worthiness, you simply affirm the words, you are a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. You have a right to be filled with the light and the joy of God. No apparent lack can cast a shadow of doubt or fear across your life. When you center your life in the awareness of the Christ consciousness, the God within. You have a right to a joyful, healthy, and prosperous life. When you are in tune with the world around you, you find joy everywhere, even if it sometimes feels distant or elusive. You listen to the forest, you listen to the desert or the mountains sing for joy. And before the Lord, once again, you feel divine love within. And within this starry heaven that blankets this earth, you feel the joy. Our scripture that supports that this morning is found in 1 Chronicles 16 and 33. Then shall the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. And I'll affirm this statement this morning. I'll speak it once, and then we'll affirm it together. And it goes like this. One with God, I am filled with joy. Together. One with God, 